I'm going to switch to English because um, we have the pleasure of having Alfonso Pecacello on stage. Um, I don't think there's an analyst that I follow more closely at the moment than Alfonso Pecacello. He's also known as Macro Elf on Twitter and he is, I think, the fastest growing audience in the world. He used to work for ING. He's Italian, he lives in Holland, so we're lucky for him to be close to us and we can ask him uh, whenever we want. And of course, he will not always say yes, but at least tonight he said yes. And he worked for ING. You, you managed, I think, uh, the whole bond, the bond portfolio of ING, 20 billion. Correct. And now uh, you're using your knowledge and experience to educate people because you have a newsletter which is free of charge. Mm -hmm. The Macro Compass, I, I strongly advise you to follow Al Alf, his newsletter, his articles. You learn a great deal about it. Um, and he will give you a very interesting presentation about what's going on in the world and what, how you can prepare as an investor for everything that's at play right now, from high inflation to increasing interest rates. There's a lot of things going on and, and Alf knows uh, as, as no one better than to really uh, make sense of it all. So um, without further ado, I, I give the floor to, uh, to Alf. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you. Thanks. Is the mic on, by the way? Yeah, it's on. So I'm Alfonso Peccatiello. If it sounds Italian, it is. I'm Italian. I, my Dutch is broken. My English has an Italian accent. Can't fix that. So all I can say is I'll try to walk you through what's going on in the world right now. But before talking about that, a brief intro, and Paul was kind enough to do one already. Um, until December last year, I ran the investment portfolio of ING Germany, so the German subsidiary of ING Bank. It was a $20 billion book, mix of mostly bonds, but also equities, credits, FX. We did a bunch of stuff there. Uh, don't do that job anymore. Actually, I decided to share as much of my knowledge as I could with you guys, for instance, being able to be here and speak. It's to me more valuable than only running money uh, for a large institution. So that's been the second step that I've taken, which is basically sharing knowledge as much as I can. Uh, the Macro Compass is basically my free platform. If you guys want to go and visit there, there are more than 100,000 people already reading that. Uh, that was the intro. Now let me see if I can get this to work. Yes, I can. So before we talk about what's going on now, we need to take a step back. And the step back is understanding how the system works in the first place. So the chart you see there is the US population growth all the way from 1900 to today. It's a percentage growth in US population. Now, have a look at all the periods, basically, apart from the wars. Um, the, the big spikes down you see there are basically war periods. If you detrend those and you look at the 1920s, the 1940s, the 1960s, you see the US population growing at roughly 1.5% to 2% a year. And why is that important is because there are two things that really drive economic growth over the very long term. Population growth, demographics, and productivity. Those are the two things. Now, if population is growing and demographics are not too bad, which means we are not getting super old over time, it means that the labor force growth will be good. It means more people will enter the labor force. More people will generate economic growth. If those people are also productive, then you can get quite a decent organic growth. You don't need to pump or engineer anything in the economy. It actually grows organically. And that was the case all the way for population growth until the 60s. To make somebody enter the labor force or to make a 20 years old, you need 20 years. So that's not a surprise that in the 70s and in the 80s, we actually were experiencing quite some decent organic economic growth. Now have a look at what, where we are today. US population growth in 2020, 2021 printed at almost 0%. The reason for that is basically we are not having enough fertility rates. Women are not making, let's say, our families are not generating enough kids as they were doing in the 60s or in the 50s, which means organically the population is growing older and there is not enough replacement. So there are more retirees and there are less young people joining the labor force. I plotted there the US, but actually I want you to have a look at the whole jurisdiction in the world. The US is actually one of the best positioned jurisdictions when it comes to labor supply growth. It's the blue line. The blue line will be trending between 2020 and 2050, roughly at 0% when it comes to how many people will be joining the labor force in the US. Now look at all those jurisdictions circled in red. Those are Japan, Western Europe, um, Russia, 
Eastern Europe, China, all of those, they're all in negative territory. So think about that. It means the people contributing actively to economic growth between 2020 and 2050, that portion of the population will be shrinking, which means that there will be more retirees adding to the equation than people literally delivering economic output. That's the setup where we are today. The setup that was there in the 70s and in the 80s has completely been destroyed by the fact that we're growing older and there are less people joining the labor force year after year. The pie is getting smaller. Now, the other thing that I told you contributes to economic growth is productivity. Because you can have less people joining the labor force, but as long as we are more productive, that's all good, right? Less people, more productivity, same level of organic economic growth. Well, look at the productivity trends, and I want you to focus on the green line. The green line is total factor productivity. Productivity of human beings and productivity of capital. So in general, how productive is our economy? Again, look at the 40s, look at the 50s, look at the 60s and the 70s. We were basically growing at productivity trends, the green bars, roughly 2% 2 2 uh, growth in productivity per year. So remember, you had population growing at 2%, productivity growing at 2%, Without engineering anything, the economy was organically growing at 4% real GDP a year. That was the 70s, that was the 80s. Now have a look at the productivity in the 2010s, the last decade. It's basically 0.5, between 0.5 and 1%. And now you'll be saying, Alf, what are you talking about? We have all these robots, we have all this you know, innovation here. How is it possible that productivity growth has actually come down? Now, Remember, this measures the change in productivity year after year, which means that, yes, when you have a technological development, and please look at the 90s and the 2000s, when these, these green bars went up, you have a first round of productivity boost. But as this becomes the new norm, and technology can only penetrate so many sectors of the economy, it cannot fully permeate them all, actually you get marginal productivity that tends to decline. So you get this productivity that keeps growing, but it's half a percent, one percent. So recap, where do we are today? Today we are not growing population and we have productivity growth that is roughly half a percent to one percent. So what I'm telling you is that if you don't boost the economy, it grows at one percent, something like that. So is it socially acceptable to have real GDP growth over the long term at half a percent, one percent? Is it socially acceptable to have Japan kind scenario in Europe, in the US? Well, actually we live in, a, in the Western world is, is very capitalistic. We want to grow faster, further, faster than the others, stronger. And you can't do that only organically. You could do that in the 80s, but not today anymore. So what did we, what did, we do? The chart starts from the 80s. It's not by coincidence, I made it so. And it looks at total economic debt as percentage of GDP. So this is not only the government, which you hear a lot about when it comes to government debt, but it's also the private sector. It's us, it's corporates. How much debt are we taking on our balance sheet to basically take future growth and move it forward? Because what we do, think about it. If you wanna buy a house here in the Netherlands, quite complicated to be honest, but <laughs> if you wanna give it a try, what you do is you show up at a bank and the bank gives you a mortgage mortgage backed transa housing transactions in the Netherlands account for 90% of housing transactions. Congrats to the guys who can buy cash, but most of us need a mortgage. And a mortgage is nothing else than showing up at a bank and saying, look at the future cash flows I will be able to generate. Look at my future salaries. Look at my future income. Now, please, on the basis of that, credit my bank account now so that I can go and buy a house that otherwise I couldn't be able to afford. This is nothing else than basically leveraging on future income, on future cash flows and bringing it all forward, creating credit, creating debt, debt today to make sure you can actually go there and buy the house. That's also what corporates do when they want to lever up their balance sheet. That's what governments do when they actually want to spend more money than they want to tax us for it they incur in debt. If you sum the government balance sheet and the private balance sheet, and you plot total economy debt, a percentage of GDP, you can take all jurisdictions, all of those, US, UK, I took France to, to have basically European barometer, China, Japan, please look at where the trend is. 
basically we all started roughly at 100, 150% of GDP 20 years ago. And whatever jurisdiction you take, you're at least at 300 now. Some places, 400. So we basically doubled our economic debt. We levered up our balance sheet to make sure that this organic growth that we have, which is now trending down, down, and down, gets a boost. But why does it get a boost from debt? Now think of it, if I get a mortgage and I go and buy a house, the next guy next to me takes a mortgage and buys a house, what it does is that this leverage we're creating boosts economic activity. It boosts nominal spending. It, boosts, it basically gives a cyclical boost to an economy which organically would only be able to deliver this amount of GDP growth. Now obviously, if you do this, what you will be doing effectively is you will be printing money, if you think about it. And this is one of the most misunderstood concepts in finance I wanted to have a chat with you about tonight. We hear probably over the last 10 years, I heard, I don't know how many times, that central banks are printing money. Now, the story is that central banks are accommodating the process, but who prints money in the first place, who allows us to get this this, our hands on money we can spend in the real economy is actually banks and the government, commercial banks and the government. So how it works. Let's talk about the government because it's not on this slide and then we'll look at the slide for a second. So think about the government. If the Dutch government would show up and would say, guys, next year I'm gonna lower your marginal tax rate by 10 percentage points. I wish they'll never do that, but <laughs> let's, let's say they do that they lower our marginal tax rate. What happens is that next year, your bank account, and nowadays all our transactions, 97% of our transactions are bank transfers. There is basically no cash left anymore. What we do is we move bank deposits from my place to Pope Bank. We just move bank deposits to each other. What the government is telling you is that your bank account next year will be larger because they're cutting your taxes. So the bill at the end of the year will be lower than it would have been otherwise. Are they also giving you a liability with it? So this is like a net asset you have. You didn't have that money before. Now the government cuts your taxes or sends you a check at home like the US government did, but it boosts your net assets. Has your government given you a liability as well? No, not really. You just got money from the government, right? That's what you got on the asset side. So every time the government decides to put into the private sector more money than it intends to tax us for, they're literally blowing a hole in their balance sheet, but we get the, the net wealth transfer. At some point, we'll need to pay it back in taxes, yes, if they want to reverse this. But in the meantime, we just got money thrown at us. So every time the government does deficits, unfunded deficits, they're transferring net wealth to us. That's the first real printer of money, money we can spend, inflationary money. That's one. The second is banks. And we explained it before, but if, you, if we walk through the process again, on the left of this diagram, you see what happens when banks are making loans. So take the, the, the left side and take the, the middle boxes, commercial banks. If you look at the, at the diagram that says before loans are made, you see the balance sheet of a normal bank. And on the asset side, they have you know, some assets, some reserves, it's an asset side of a bank. And on the liability side, they have customer deposits in red. So that will be us depositing our money at the bank. It's a typical balance sheet. Now, let's assume that a bank wants to make a loan. What I want you to understand is that the bank doesn't use reserves. It doesn't use existing deposit. The bank literally credits our account when we go and ask for a mortgage. The bank wants to know whether we will be able to pay back, whether they'll make enough money from lending to us, and whether the return on equity will be good. That's all they want to know. If these three things are fine, they'll credit our bank account. So literally they will grow their balance sheet. And obviously they need deposits on the liability side. They need a funding mechanism for that. Now, every time they create a new loan, let's say a mortgage, they lend me money. My balance sheet has increased. I buy a house from Paul. Good for you, Bo. Buy a house from Paul. Paul had a house before. I now have money I didn't have before. That's the mortgage. So the bank has credited my account. I buy the house from Paul. Paul now all of a sudden has this bank deposits that I transfer to his bank, Rabo or whatever he's using. And he finds himself with more bank deposits as well. 
Now, Paul needs to deposit this somewhere, Rabobank, ING, I don't know who he banks with, which means that all of a sudden, compared to the situation before, the entire system, the entire private sector, has more bank deposits, has more money we can spend. The money I used to buy the house from Paul before didn't exist. Now he doesn't have the house anymore, we have transacted his asset, he has this newly created money. He takes his money and deposits it at, at another bank, or he can spend it in the real economy. He can go and buy a car, he can go and buy a new computer. Banks, every time they land, are increasing the amount of money that there is in the private sector. Commercial, uh, pr uh, central banks, on the right, because I want to talk about quantitative easing for a second. People think that quantitative easing is the way that central banks print money. What is quantitative easing, guys? So have a look at the right side of the slide now and focus on the middle again, central bank. So on the left, you see the, the typical balance sheet of a central bank before quantitative easing. They have some assets and they have some liabilities. And the liabilities for a central bank are so-called so bank reserves. Now, a central bank does QE, and we hear they print money. Okay, let's see what happens in reality. They digitally increase their balance sheet. They literally put some keystrokes in a computer, they create bank reserves. You see those, this green stack, it goes up. Now, these bank reserves are used to buy bonds. That's what quantitative easing is. They show up and they buy some bonds. So they add that to, the, to their balance sheet, that purple thing, which is government debt. So they bought it, okay. Now, what happens to who sold these government bonds from them? Let's say it's a pension fund. That's the top, top side of the right-hand part of the slide. A pension fund, before quantitative easing, had some bonds on their balance sheet, they invest in those, and on the liability side, it has our pension premium. They need to pay us at some point some pension in the future. They have sold the purple box to the central bank. A government bond has been sold with the QE to the central bank. Look at what happens there. So the pension fund balance sheet has been changed in composition. It has not grown, the stock is not higher. It has just been changed in balance sheet. They now have a deposit instead of a, a government bond. They've sold it and they now have some cash, some deposit, they have deposited to a bank. And that's the, all that happened. And on the commercial bank side, yeah, okay, this deposit from the pension fund now goes to the liability side of the bank and the bank has more reserves. Okay, interesting. How much money do we have more compared to before? Because we are the ones that are supposed to use this money. We are the private sector that should benefit from the money printing from central banks. Do you see any spendable money ending on our balance sheet from quantitative easing? I only see some swaps of assets. The pension fund had a bond, now has a deposit. Okay, so the, the commercial bank has more reserves. But do you see anything happening? If the commercial bank would all of a sudden decide to lend more, yeah, okay, that will end up on our balance sheet. If the government will decide to make more deficits, yes, that will end up on our balance sheet. If the central bank only does QE, literally nothing happens to our balance sheet. Reserves, the green stuff that gets printed, that's the only stock that goes up, really. Reserves are money for banks. It's stuck in the system, it doesn't get out. If banks want to lend to us, they take a unilateral decision. They increase their balance sheet and they lend money to, to us. So this was all explained to make sure that you understand that new loans for a bank are debt for us. So every time a bank makes a loan to us, we increase our debt, but also we increase the amount of money we have. It goes back to this point, total economic debt to GDP. Governments doing deficits have transferred money to the private sector, but they have also increased their debt. Banks transferring money to us, yes, but it comes with a liability, a mortgage, debt goes up. So what we do is we lever up our balance sheet in order to have more money to spend, in order to have more cyclical economic activity that can make up for this, for productivity going down, for labor supply growth going down. So basically we are tricking the system by levering up both our private balance sheet and the government balance sheet, till you go at 300, 400% of GDP, okay. So the question is, at this point, what happens? How, how can the system maintain its equilibrium in such a setup? Is it possible that every time we keep up levering more and more and more? Now, a system that is so leveraged actually has one big problem, which is instability. 
Hyman Minsky, which is a great economist um, of the 60s, 70s, used to say that stability breeds instability. And I agree, because the more you lever up a system, the more you put everybody in the same boat. So think of a housing crisis. The more you stimulate mortgages and lending growth, the more people will want to buy the house, because maybe mortgage rates are cheaper. And so getting a new mortgage to buy a house becomes very convenient. So the next guy goes buy a house. The next guy goes buy a house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What happens is that there is basically artificial stability. You are suppressing any volatility. You are sending everybody on the same boat. But a system like that is very prone to instability. And that's basically what we're witnessing now. So I gave you a panoramic view to go and talk about what's happening today. So what's happening today is basically this big cliff you see on this blue line. So let me talk for a second about what this blue line is. This blue line is an indicator that I develop, which tries to look at the five largest economies in the world. So that would be Europe, US, China, Japan, and the UK. The UK, maybe I should take them out. Should uh, do something else. <laughs> okay, in that chart, the UK was there. This blue line shows, takes the five largest economies, and then shows how much money does the private sector have at any point in time. Are the bank accounts of corporates and households going up very fast or not very fast? And why is that important? Because if we have more money, we'll end up spending more. The economy will be cyclically stronger. If we have less money, if banks are not lending anymore, if the government wants to tax us more, then at some point we'll end up spending less money and the economy will slow down. Now, you can see that what I did in this chart is basically plot this credit impulse. That's how I call this metric. And also plot in orange what happens to earnings per share, what happens to economic growth, what happens to, to basically to companies. Are they producing more or less earnings? Now, see every time the blue line goes down over the last 25 years, what has happened to earnings growth? Now, in 2008, the blue line collapsed, and we all remember that, because banks were basically saying, sorry, no credit anymore, you guys are going bust. And the governments as well were paralyzed for a couple of years. So there was no new money creation for us. And earnings in the S&P 500 companies, 12 months later, dropped by 30%. Look again in 2016. I don't know whether you remember that China was basically slowing down very hard and that even the renminbi would become unpegged against the dollar and it was all of a global slowdown. Earnings went down by 5%. And normally earnings grow over time. We produce economic growth. Companies are profitable. So the, these orange dots should be higher, should be normally positive, 5 to 10%. In 2019, it all, they also grew by 0%. The economy was slowing down. Now, I want you to focus on what happened in 2020, 2021. You see that boost higher there? That is the fastest ever amount of money creation. Not QE, proper money creation, our money. Why? Think about it. So the governments decided that they basically didn't want almost anybody to go bust, especially in the US. So they started sending checks at home to people. Don't know whether you have heard of it, but people in the US just opened a post box and found checks. $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. Not too bad. This is literally money being thrown at people. Banks, they would have been paralyzed because the world was falling apart. Everything was closed. It was pandemic. The government went to banks and said, don't worry. You can lend to Paul. Even if Paul goes belly up, I'm going to guarantee your loan. So you're not going to lose anything. Just please give money to Paul. This combination led to the strongest amount of credit creation, money creation for us ever in this series. Of course, in 2021, the economy grew like hell as a result. Earnings were up 45%. GDP was up 4 to 5% in a single year. But what happened after 2021? So the last stimulus check sent in the US was in March 2021. Since then, the private sector hasn't seen any new money coming in from the government. Banks, yeah, they've lent a little bit. And the same in Europe. We haven't seen any new money. Actually, I haven't seen any money at all from the Dutch government, but that's another story. Also, my fellow guys in Italy have seen some money, but then at some point, the government said, well, it's, the economy is running. I don't need to help you anymore. Banks are like, yeah, okay, I'm going to lend some money, but not much. What happens is that the new money creation for the private sector collapses. Governments are not doing deficits anymore. They want to tax us more. Banks are still a little bit defensive. See that cliff there. 
This cliff is basically as fast as the cliff we are seeing we saw in 2008, 2009 which doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get the same type of recession, but what it means is that economic growth will slow down. We will see a recession. We will see earnings slowing down. Now, the, the, the green dot there is analyst expectations for earnings growth. It's what I call la la land, at least. Now, the other story is, the housing market. And, and the reason why I want to talk about it is that, well, I can make the example with the Netherlands. Yes. So basically, since I moved here, um, how the housing market just went up 10 to 15% a year. It's great. You could just close your eyes, buy a house, goes up. Five years, it doubles. Awesome. So the reason why that is the case is because credit became cheaper and cheaper at every iteration. Every time you showed up at a bank, you had a, a lower mortgage rate. So think about it. If you make 3,000 a month, right, and you go to a bank and you say, lend me money, how much will they lend basically depends on how cheap interest rates are. If interest rates are lower, your salary can be leveraged up more because your mortgage installment that you have to pay every month with the lower mortgage rate will be actually lower and lower and lower. So basically, even if your salary doesn't grow, but the mortgage rates become lower and lower, you can afford buying a house that costs more. Now you're seeing the reverse. So basically, last year, if you made three or 4,000 wanted to buy a house with mortgage rates at 2%, you could borrow 500,000, just saying a number. This year, if you show up at the bank and ask, with the same salary, to borrow money to buy a house, they'll, they'll lend you 30% less. So what happens is that, effectively, new marginal buyers are cut out of the market. The combination of housing prices being doubled what they were five years ago, and mortgage rates not being 2% anymore, but being 5%, makes so that unless your salary has grown 40%, congratulations if it has, but I don't know many people to, to whom that has happened, when you show up at a bank, your marginal power is much less. So you'll get lent much less money, which means as a marginal buyer, you can't afford much, to be honest. So buyers are cut out of the market. Okay, does it mean house prices have to drop 50%? Not necessarily. Sellers can just say, uh, I'm not gonna sell. So I just sit on my house, I wanted to sell, I'm just gonna freeze, this is temporary, it's fine. Um, this is literally happening in the US, and I guess this will happen in the Netherlands as well over the next three to six months. It's already actually happening. What happens though, and people tend to think again in La La Land that people, sellers can just freeze and it's going to be fine. Let's make the example of the US. In the US, almost 20% of GDP is linked to the housing market. Construction workers, um, brokers, uh, realtors, uh, furniture shops, uh, whatever. 12 plus million jobs are linked to the US housing market. Now imagine it goes to a freeze. No new marginal buyers, sellers are not freezing. What's going to happen to these jobs? Obviously, they're going to get cut. They're going to get a hit. This chart that you, that you see there shows on the orange left-hand side an indicator which grasps the activity going on in the housing market. And if you see it going up, so look at that orange line, it goes up very fast. It's because the indicator is inverted. So the activity is collapsing as fast as it did in 2008. You see that orange line going up in 2008? Again, it's inverted. Eh? So there was the collapse in housing activity in the US. Now, see that orange line going up today, inverted in your head, and that's economic activi housing activity completely coming to a stall in the US. I also drew the blue line close to it, US unemployment rate. It's on the right hand side. So what happens every time housing activity stops, so the line goes up, remember it's inverted. With a bit of a lag, you can see really the blue line is basically the orange line shifted to the right by 12 months. Unemployment rate goes up like hell. That's what happened in 2008, 2009. And it makes sense because the housing jobs are getting basically cut because there is no activity anymore. Why would I keep hiring people in the housing market if it's frozen? Now, this is a vicious circle where people get unemployed and they, if they had a lot of money in their house and they don't get a job, they literally will tap the equity which is in the house, which means they will sell the house and raise this money that they've accumulated over the last five years of 
buoy and house, housing market, and this will reinforce the mechanism. So instead of having a, free, a frozen housing market, you'll now have a housing market where the buyers can't afford crap, and the sellers are not standing on the sidelines, they're selling because they're losing their job. So this is why I think that unemployment rate in the Netherlands, in the US, in Europe, in actually most places that use the housing market as this wealth generation machine that was infallible, it was only going up. Actually, now they're going to get a little bit of the reverse effect, which means that basically every time you try and boost the economy cyclically very, very strong, like you did in 2021, there is a very high chance you're going to get a cliff. It's like uh, drinking too much Coca-Cola. You get a good sugar rush, and then three hours later, you're like, ah. I feel like crap. It's basically the same going on here. We pumped credit. We pumped the housing market, not only. We pumped the stock market. We pumped anything we could. And now we are likely to get a little bit of the reverse effect. The other thing, I mean, of course, over the last 10 years, we are used to central bankers telling us, don't worry. If the, if the housing market goes down, if the stock market goes down, we'll have your back. It's going to be fine. We'll do some QE, we'll ease monetary policy, we'll help you, we'll lower interest rates. Yeah, but uh, now I don't think it's going to be the case anymore. So this is core services inflation in the US. Why did I choose not just inflation, but core services inflation? So inflation is basically the rising price of a basket of items, right? And if you think of it in that basket, headline basket, you will find oil, food, tobacco, services, uh, goods, you will find a bunch of stuff. Some of these are very volatile. So say tomorrow we have a bad harvest, uh, food prices are likely to go up, but that's very volatile. It's weather driven, it's, it's really volatile. What central bankers care about is that the more stable component of this inflation basket are actually around 2%. Because that informs us when it comes to investment decisions, salary negotiations, is those sticky items that, we, that drive our decisions the most. Core services are the stickiest component of the inflation basket out there. Those are like rents, for example. I mean, rents don't move up and down 20% a year. They're relatively sticky and stable. I just, just, to make, just to give you an example. So if you take these core services, that's what central bankers care the most about. And indeed, you can see that in, in the 2000, 2020 period, if you try to isolate that, they basically ranged in the US around two to 3%. Now, that was acceptable for central bankers. In 2008, you got a sharp drop because of the crisis. Can you please look at the chart today? It's basically almost off the grids. It's 7% year on year. So central bankers, like in 2021, they told us that it was transitory, that they could look through some of these price increases, they would normalize. Now they can't make up that story anymore. This is the sharpest, fastest increase in core sticky item inflation that we have ever witnessed since, well, I have 1985 on the chart, and this is faster. So which means that central bankers cannot come to the rescue. They literally can't. It doesn't make sense for them. It, it is against their mandate. Their mandate is price stability. It's not housing market up 15% a year. It's not stock market up 15% a year. It's price stability. Wow, that doesn't look to me like price stability, that chart. So that basically paralyzes central bankers, actually forces them to intervene, to make things tighter, to make interest rates higher, to make us want to spend less to slow the economy down. So this is the first time over 20, 30, 40 years that central bankers are actively looking to slow the economy down to make sure that inflation comes down too. That's quite a change compared to the last 10 to 20 years, which brings us to what the heck do we do for our portfolio? How do we behave in this environment? So this is basically my, one of my main big picture tools when it comes to asset allocation. Of course, it's not the only thing I look at when I decide how to skew my portfolio, but it's one of the main things. So this is a compass, basically, and it's four quadrants. It's relatively simple to move along the axis. So what are these axes? The x-axis that you see on top is called forward-looking macro indicators. Wow, it sounds very fancy. It's just a, a list of indicators that I've built and, and tested statistically over the last 10 years 
that basically are able to anticipate what's going to happen in economic growth. Is the growth impulse going to accelerate or decelerate? You remember that credit impulse that I showed you before with earnings that follow what happens there 12 months later? That's one of these forward-looking macro indicators. And you can move on the, on the axis of right or left depending on whether they're pointing up or they're pointing down. Gives you an idea of where economic growth is going to be. That's likely going to be reflected in assets as well. It tells you whether earnings are going to go up and you can buy equities and you can think the economy is going to be strong or not. The other axis looks at the monetary policy stunts. So that's basically what policymakers are doing, what they're telling us they're going to be doing. Are they going to make things cheaper when it comes to interest rates? Are they going to tighten up the belt? How fast are they going to do that? There is a blend of indicators built on that axis that tells me what these guys are likely to do. And right now, let's look at where we are today. We talked about forward-looking macro indicators. I showed you that housing index in the US, and I showed you the, the credit impulse that I track. Both of them were pointing down very fast. So the orange line is inverted, remember. So if it goes up, it means it's really going down. And this is, well, pretty much self-descriptive, I think. They're both going down. And then the other thing is what are central bankers going to do, right? That's on this other axis. Now, look at this inflation spike. What do you think they're going to do? They literally do not have a choice anymore. Now, if they don't have a choice anymore, what happens is that you will be on the net tightening side of this quadrant. So you will be down and you will be to the left. The economy will be decelerating and central bankers will need to tighten the stunts. So you end up in quadrant four. A quadrant four is basically the scariest of all. It's literally what we have seen this year, since 2000, and, uh, basically since January this year. You cannot, as an investor, it's very hard to sit on, on a portfolio and go to sleep which worked very well for the last 10 years. I mean, you just bought a bunch of stuff, bonds, gold, NASDAQ, equities, and you went to sleep and next year they were 20% up on average, 10, 15%. Now, this doesn't exist anymore. In this environment where you have both economic growth slowing down very fast and central bankers not helping you out, you are in the worst possible setup as an investor that should decide where the, whether to allocate their, their assets. So. Since the beginning of the year, this model luckily has been pointed to the right direction, which is, as my mentor used to say at ING, there is a time to go long, time to go short, and a time to go fishing. <laughs> and they, I mean, not every investor can be short. It takes derivatives, options, and all that fancy stuff. But you can go to fishing. And, and going fishing basically means, according to this model, having a very healthy cash allocation. And cash is not a fancy instrument. I mean, for the last 20 years, I yielded even negative. I mean, if you park money on a bank account, then you've been charged for it. You criminal park money on a bank account. You have to invest. Nowadays, there are a lot of alternatives. If you, for instance, buy a very short dated treasury bond, you get 5%. I mean, this stuff hasn't been seen for like 25, 30 years. So basically, the safest alternatives are the ones that are able to at least try and protect your purchasing power in this environment. When are things going to change? Well, it's very simple. When the macro indicators point up, but we just said that looking 12 months ahead, that's not likely to be the case. Or when central bankers will decide that that's enough, that they can come in and say, OK, guys, you're not going to put your mortgage rate to 10%. I mean, at some point, we're going to calm down. We're going to make interest rates more affordable. But that can only be done when uh, this line stops going up. But not only stops going up, it needs to go back to 2%. Because the other thing I hear often is, no, 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 Alf, don't. now it's 7 but if it goes back to 4 central bankers will be fine. Ah. This reminds me of, um, so remember, central bank's inflation target is 2%. If inflation slows down to 4% and central banks are okay with it, they completely lose credibility. It reminds me of a striker uh, that plays for Real Madrid or whatever, and he can't score for 10 matches in a row. So his target is to score, he can't score for 10 matches in a row. And then he shows up to, um, to the president and the trainer and he says, well, I have a solution. Let's actually move the goalpost closer to me so I can just score. So, he doesn't get credibility by doing that. He gets credibility by scoring where the goalpost is. And the goalpost is 2%, not 4 not 5 Central bankers have been very clear that not fighting inflation hard enough 
strong enough and regaining credibility actually is more expensive later on because you lose credibility. And the battle of the 70s and the 80s that Volcker had to do in the US actually teaches Powell and other central banks exactly that. So central bankers will be tight until we get inflation back to 2%. The last topic before I stop blubber, blubbering in English Italian is uh, the dollar. So that's another super misunderstood thing. We live in a dollar centric system. So let me try to explain how this works. Look at the first chart, top of that. The US, the red bars there, accounts for only 10% of world trade and roughly 20% of world GDP. That's it, no more than that. Now look at those blue stocks. The US accounts for 80% of FX transaction volume. Anything is transacted against US dollars, basically. It accounts for 40% of global international debt securities, 50% of cross-border loans, and 50% of trade invoicing. So let, let's talk about what these things are. Trade invoicing will be Brazil that sells soybeans denominated in dollars. Turkey that wants to borrow to you know, bust, uh, bolster their economic growth, they'll borrow in dollars. FX transaction volumes, we talked about that. Effectively, the dollar is, despite accounting only for 10 or 20% of GDP and trade growth, is the item that we have chosen to be the center of our economic system. So we'll get all the trades done in dollars, we'll get everything denominated in dollar, we'll get borrowing in dollar. So why have we done that? Because the US has basically, with Pax Americana and with the dollar being the global reserve currency, has effectively decide elected to be at the, at the center of the system. It basically allows the system to flourish, allows the system to be, being denominated in dollar is one common denominator, which allows a lot of, of economic transactions and economic growth to happen across the world. Now there is a problem though, because if you look at the below charts, the below charts, look at the world part, shows how many bonds and loans have been issued in dollars to companies that are not residing in the United States. So this will be European banks borrowing in dollars, a Brazilian corporate borrowing in dollar. In 2000, this amount left a, a right hand side of the chart was roughly $2 trillion. Today it's 12, you see that, that red circle out there. $12 trillion of debt denominated in dollars and sitting on the balance sheet of an entity which is not in America. Okay, so you have a, a debt in a foreign currency. So how do you service it? You cannot, you know, a Brazilian corporate does not get their hands on dollars naturally. How, how do they service this debt? How do they pay the coupons? How do they pay it back? They pay it back by getting their hands organically on dollars via trade flows, trade growth. So if a lot of ships are coming to Brazil and getting soybeans and commodities and Brazil is exporting, they get their dollar in and they can use it to service their dollar debt. And that's no problem, it works, it's great. What happens when trade growth slows down like it is today? What happens when the economy is slowing down? What happens when the dollar strengthens? So basically the denominator that we have chosen to make the system flourish becomes a problem because people cannot get their hands on the dollar. They, they cannot print dollar in Brazil, they need organic dollar flows. When they stop, you have a problem. So every time that people wanna talk about the death of the dollar, I do understand where they come from, but I also want you to know that we have basically created a system that is leveraged on the dollar. And when there is a problem, the denominator of this leverage actually becomes more valuable because more people want to get their hands on the dollar itself to make sure they can pay out their debt as fast as they can because they see what's coming. It becomes a vicious circle. And that's the reason why the dollar has been appreciating basically against anything else this year. Because the economy is slowing down, people are indebted in dollars, they're looking for a way to get their hands on the dollar as fast as they can so they can get rid of the problem. And uh, with this very nice note, uh, I would like to open maybe for uh, questions, if Paul is fine, or comments, or... Yeah, amazing story, Elf, and uh, very well substantiated, as always, with uh, beautiful charts. Uh, very um, interesting. I'm sure the audience loved it. So the death of the dollar maybe is not 
on the monetary horizon anytime soon. But before today, we talked a lot about the euro mm -hmm. and how sustainable the euro is. Yeah. What is your view on the sustainability of the euro? It's not. <laughs> it's very simple. So what we did is basically 20 years ago, we, we had a look at geopolitics and strategy and we effectively understood that a bunch of countries getting in, in one agreement could negotiate better with China, with the US, with Russia. So there was a lot of upside in the euro from that perspective, Paul, but let's be honest. I mean, we aggregated together 20 countries that don't really have a lot in common, right? I mean, it's, 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 uh, there are, it's 19 jurisdictions with 19 different features sitting under one umbrella, a very imperfect one. But tonight it works. Tonight it works, yes, uh, I hope. But the, the, there are 19 different jurisdictions sitting under one umbrella, a very imperfect one. There is one central bank setting monetary policy for 19 different places. So now Germany wants higher interest rates and Italy is like, please, no. But of course, this, this, you know, these divergences, you'll always find it. You'll never solve it. You have fiscal powers that are completely different. You know, Germany wants some rules. Spain wants something else. You have to try and put them together under one umbrella. So just stop? Is that the solution? Uh, no, because... As uh, especially at this stage, it's geopolitically impossible. We're literally fighting a war, basically. And right now, disgregating the Eurozone will be just geopolitically impossible. So what's going to happen, as always it happens in Europe, is every time you have serious stress, you'll bring the stress to the extreme until you lock these guys in, uh, in a room somewhere in the European Commission, they found out a compromise. But more organically, if you think of the Eurozone, the reason why it flourished really for the last 20, 20 25 years is that it's a model based on two uh, very cheap sources of leverage, an economic leverage and a financial leverage. So the economic leverage comes from the fact that for the last 20 years, think of Germany. Germany imported only 30 billion worth on Russian natural gas. And it used this very cheap source of energy, very readily available, to come up with manufacturing output, which was almost 2 trillion euros. Also, it outsourced not only Germany, but the Netherlands, Italy, anybody, outsourced manufacturing costs where it was the cheapest. Poland, Hungary, Asia, wherever it works, and the supply chains were perfect. Always on time, you had uh, you know, deliveries coming. It was basically non-inflationary growth. That was perfect. The second source of leverage was financial leverage. So we made borrowing costs cheaper, cheaper, and cheaper, so we can all buy a bigger house, a more expensive one, and we have this wealth effect that fits through the economy. Now look at today. Energy is not cheap anymore. Yeah, my bill came last day. Definitely not cheap. Uh, and so this is not going to be solved anytime soon because we have pipelines problems, really like physical problems. Where are we going to get the natural gas from, really? And the second is manufacturing. Um, so we have basically offshored everything. And now we have found out that supply chains can get disrupted, that you don't get your car parts basically, right? So you want to try and onshore some of those, but if you bring it in-house, it's going to get more expensive, right? You don't pay a Polish salary to somebody working in Germany. That, that really doesn't work. So that source of leverage is being challenged, and wealth and economic leverage, financial leverage, that's also getting challenged because interest rates are going up, as we discussed. So the model quickly becomes very unstable. Yeah. Well, uh... We're doomed. Um, let's let's open up for two more questions because uh, and we also have another panel left. And then um, there's the question over here. Thank you very much for the presentation. What would you recommend to crypto investors going in 2023, 2024? It's okay. Short question, short answer. Another question. Uh, so would you say that uh, central bank digital currency and a universal basic income would be plausible? Um, so I think uh, policymakers understood in 2020-21 that if they literally give money to people rather than money to banks, which is what quantitative easing is, if they give money to the private sector, to people, to households, to corporates, actually you do generate economic growth. Now, there is a problem, though. If you stop giving money to people, then you will face a cliff, which is exactly what we see in this chart. So they gave money to the private sector in 2021. GDP in the US grew at 5.5%. It works. Problem is that you have to keep doing that the year after, the year after, the year after, and the year after, 
which not all policymakers are very ready for. And I think actually they realize that it works, it can fight crisis very effectively, but it also scared them because one of the outcomes of giving a lot of money to the private sector was this. And they don't really want to see this very often because it, it really de-anchors their, their target, which is inflation at 2%. So it's a yes and a no, but at least it, it put some, it woke them up to a certain extent. Right. Um, first of all, let's be very specific. Most of world's debts is in euro dollars, not dollars. So were you talking about dollars or euro dollars? And if it's euro dollar, isn't it a counterparty and collateral issue rather than that it's not possible to issue how many euro dollars you want? Because every bank could do it unless it doesn't have collateral. That's correct. So the euro, this is basically the euro dollar system or a part of it. It's not a complete picture of the euro dollar system, but it's a part of it. The euro dollar system is nothing else than entities not sitting in, in the US being able to produce dollar loan and getting dollar funding. So this was not possible until the 80s. You had to be in the US to issue dollar debt, to issue a dollar loan. And since the 80s, actually, you can do that through the euro dollar system. This is a, p a partial picture. It's much more complicated than this, but this is a partial picture. Yes, of course, you can keep issuing uh, euro dollar debt. You can. You need good collateral to be able to do that. And most, most, most importantly, you need to be able to avoid squeezes like the one we are seeing today. So when you issue dollar loans and the dollar appreciates, the, the denominator goes up and it squeezes the collateral away from the system. It's a margin call. It's a similar thing to what happened in the UK pension fund system. You can keep doing that, but you will get more exposed to these squeezes. Yes, and that's, that's another thing. Because if you have most of the emerging markets being most deeply in euro dollars and also it's not that easy to see who and why but we know most if these default because they have their own uh, currency on the other side of their balance this means that their debt in euro dollar will nullify with it the artificial demand to it meaning that this is a meltdown of the euro dollar system and if it's bad to borrow in Bitcoin, well, it's sure enough bad to borrow in a melting up currency, right? Especially if you defaulted. So what option do they have then when they have to issue new debt? If the euro dollar is still going up. Well, as somebody I interviewed recently on my podcast said, it was very interesting. The end of the world is bullish for things because if we need to worry about the end of the world, then you'd rather just buy some stuff. I mean, what, what bad can happen if the world is going to end? You'd rather be long something. Now, with this uh, last uh, words from my side, Paul, if you'd allow me just 30 seconds, I know we're way over time. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so thanks, first of all, for being so engaged. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you guys. Uh, as I said, I used to work for ING and run money. Uh, I, I do this now, which is sharing my knowledge for free with as many people as I can. Feel free to check this out. Um, and uh, I just wanted to thank you guys all for the attention and uh, the fun we had together. Thanks,